So we're now on this uh, rooftop terrace, which people were able to enjoy back in the in the 1930s, right through through the 40s until it stopped being a rooftop restaurant and tea rooms. It is now probably one third of the size of what it was originally, but as a backdrop, it enjoyed this beautiful tower, this amazing structure. Now, this amazing structure was put there not as a functional structure as such. It was pretty much internally void. It was put there as a gesture, as a beacon of light, which would light up the city at night. And it was internally lit and externally lit. And it was there as a, I suppose, as a monument of the strength of the order. Back in the time when they were looking to get approval for the height limit of this building, they were confined to this height, which was no higher than the tip of the town hall clock. So what they did was they said, OK, we'll build up to this height, but then we'll then build a steeple or a tower past that height so that we can make it the tallest building in Melbourne, so that we can advertise the building as the tallest building in Melbourne. And so they built another almost six storeys up above the actual building. When you are at street level, that tower looks quite dwarfed. But when you come up here, you realise that the sheer enormity of the structure. There's a beautiful spiral staircase that runs, a Victorian spiral staircase that runs from that middle level all the way to the very tip to which can take you to the base of the flagpole. Up to about 20 or 25 years ago, some poor soul would attach himself to that flagpole, climb all the way to the top of it and paint his way down. <laughs> Nowadays, we can't have anyone do that. And so that's why that flagpole doesn't look as painted as what it should be. Just let's imagine what you would have actually had as a view up here back in 19... 32 when you were sitting up here drinking Earl Grey. Down in the corner there you would have the Regent Theatre, which was only built three years ago. Just past that you'd have the TNG building, which was also built three years ago. All the way up Collins Street on that side you would have these glorious three, four, five storey Victorian buildings, most of which were resided with surgeons, doctors, dentists. On this side the Athenaeum Theatre, built approximately 80 years earlier, and Scots Church even earlier still. Past that, again, glorious buildings all the way up to Parliament House. In this direction, you would have this amazing view of St Paul's Cathedral, which still remains. Past that, you would have the Botanical Gardens and Governor House, which you can still see beautifully, right through into the paddocks of Mount Waverley and Glen Waverley area. In this direction, there was very, very little at all that would impede your view. In this direction, you would see all the way down to the Victorian terraces of Port Melbourne, South Melbourne and Alpha Park, all the way to the bay, right through you would see down to Frankston and Mount Eliza, which had certainly some expansion of population through there because that's pretty much where everyone wanted to live along the coastline. In this direction, you would look up again in the distance paddocks, but you would see Carlton Gardens and right through up to Melbourne University. It was a very, very special spot to come up here and drink some tea and, and have a refined scone or two or three. Now, let's talk about some funny stories about the building and some serious stories. Who can forget the triple murders that occurred of three jewellers back in 1978, where a brazen attacker decided to park his car out the front, walk upstairs, get these three people to lie down, shoot them all in the back of their head, take the diamonds, walk away, drive away, never be found. The pyjama girl mystery, where a girl who worked in the Manchester Unity Building was found and nobody knew who she was, where she was from and what her name was. And so the police decided to put her in formalin for 12 or 15 years to have her identified by somebody and no one ever was able to identify her. And then the incident where the two crocodiles that were in the basement of the building which were part of the restaurant that was there decided to go for a walk to look for water and they found themselves in the sub basement and they were there for a number of days until an electrician going down there to work tripped over one of them and why were they down in the sub basement because this entire building sits on huge wells of water why are they water because back in 1932 they wanted to cool this building down so they would bring enormous chunks of ice they would cart them in, put them into these wells, run air across the top of them and cool this entire building through the reticulation system that you have through this building. So they had air conditioning Flintstone style. 
they were also able to heat the building in this manner. This building was made of its, its heritage significance and isn't purely its location and its amazing Gothic tower. It's also the mechanical engineering that went into it in terms of, and also the electrical and civil engineering that went into it. The letter chute that runs all the way down, the bin chute that existed in the building, the glazed terracotta tiles that are the faience of the building that were done in a way whereby the pollution and water and stains would just wash off it. Also the elevators and obviously the escalator that we've already discussed. We're about to now go to the most special part of the building where the Manchester Unity Board of Directors as such would hold their board meetings and the CEO which in those days was called the Grand Secretary would have his office. The CEO placed his office on the very corner of the building, on the corner of Collins and Swanson Street, and basically at the top of the building with only the tower above him. It's almost like the crown. That CEO's office still is intact and has been restored back to its original beauty. And when I take you through there, I want you to imagine what has transpired over the years. For 50 years, the Manchester Unity held this building in its own care. It rented out the spaces that it didn't want to use itself, which was pretty much the ground floor right through to level 9. It used level 10 and level 11 for its own purposes and eventually it realised it was growing out of the space and it sold the property in 1985 thereabouts for just over $5 million. Now, think about it. You can't buy a single corner shop right now, a single 15 metre shop now for that amount of money. And that's only 25 years, what hindsight can tell you. They sold it to a developer by the name of Mr. Chiao. He was an Asian developer who had come along and wanted to redo the whole building and make it like brand new again. Because during that 50 year period of Manchester Unity's tenor, because they were an insurance company and they worked on margins, they weren't able to upkeep this building. This building was done in a way whereby it required a lot of maintenance and upkeep. When you put in all of this mod cons of air conditioning and mechanical and electrical and civil engineering, all of this has to either be maintained or reinvented as, as the building ages. That wasn't done. In fact, the carpet that was down in the boardroom was still the same carpet 52 years on. So you can just imagine it wouldn't have been in very good nick anymore. So they decided to sell and move on. And they moved on to a building on the corner of Dorcas Street and St Kilda Road. Mr Chow tried to do too much and eventually he realised, no, this is no good for me, I'm going to sell it. The developers that then moved in to start developing this area were the developers had also developed level 10 and level 11. And in order to develop this in the mid 1990s, their attitude was, let's come along and let's make apartments out of these and let's paint everything white and do the 1990s white boxes that people were buying in their droves. So when I take you downstairs, I'll explain to you how we have gone back and reinvigorated the space out of being apartments, back to being the original office spaces that would have been there going through from the boardroom and the Grand Secretary's office right through into the areas where their subordinates would work.